Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Pokolsky, Muscle Expert Podcast. And today we're going to dive deep, science dive today, about detoxification. Uh, it doesn't sound like a sexy topic, but let me tell you guys, if you're toxic and your body is storing to toxins or maybe you're not detoxifying properly, it can be a massive hindrance on your progress, your ability to build muscle, your ability to lose fat, your ability to create hormones for yourself, your ability to create neurotransmitters in your brain. All of this stuff is influenced by your body's ability to detoxify. And believe it or not, Dr. Brian Walsh tells us exactly what we're doing wrong, some of the most common mistakes that everyone's doing day to day that they think is helping detoxify their body in reality is actually preventing detoxification. And I'm actually guilty of some, some of the stuff too. So I'm very grateful to have Dr. Brian Walsh on here today. And today's podcast is brought to you by ATP Labs. We've just released a brand new product that you guys are going to love. It's called Myo Prime. Uh, and this is just a creatine-based product with some ATP and HMB. And the reason I love this product is it's kind of an add-on to your current pre-workout. So you guys know I'm not a big stimulant person, but I am a big focus person. And creatine really helps add to that focus product that I always take. So you guys know I'm a big fan of the GF, which is the growth factor by ATP, which is primarily just alpha-GPC and tyrosine, driving up some dopamine and acetylcholine in your brain. But if you want to add the pump factor and the cellular energy to that so that you can have the fuel you need to fuel your workouts, then I highly suggest you add Myo Prime. And if you think I'm cool, I think you're cool too. So if you use the code BEN10, B-E-N, and the number 1010, you get 10% off this month only. Enjoy the podcast. Detoxification is one of the most misunderstood paradigms in all of nutrition and in the fitness world. And today we have an amazing uh, expert, Dr. Brian Walsh. Thank you for joining me, sir. Hey, Ben. Pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to digging in on this because um, it's massively misunderstood. Some people say you can't detox. Some people say you have to support detox. Some people are huge de detox advocates. And there's just this huge misunderstanding around the whole paradigm of what actually needs to happen to support detoxification in the body and drive it up and all the downstream influences that can have on somebody's body. So hormones, fat loss, metabolism, brain function, uh, all these things, hormonal endocrine function. Uh, let's talk about all that stuff. Um, or, and, and I don't even know where to start, but I'm sure you do. <laughs> no, <clears throat> you hit it on the head. So I think the best thing I could do is just give you a little history about myself. So I, I, and I've been into nutrition. I mean, I was thinking about, you know, we're going to be on this call. You know, I was a bodybuilder type. I was actually thinking back to, you know, the first muscle and fitness and flex magazine that I bought. And I was, uh, you know, so young, I had to ride my bike down to 7-Eleven. I couldn't <laughs> right. even drive there yet. And I can name you all those guys back in the day. Um, so as somebody interested in health, as you do, you know, you read the lay people books about detoxification and, you know, how you're going to die if you're, if you're too toxic and all these things. And so I'm a, I'm a naturopathic physician now, and, and I, I've been around long enough to have seen all these different things. Detoxification 20 years ago was like the Betty Ford Clinic. You get some washed sure. up druggy celebrity. That, that, right. That's what detoxification was. And then nowadays... They have, you know, foot baths and, and foot pads and colonics and enemas. And the one that kills me the most is you'll see somebody say, you know, drink lemon juice in the morning to detoxify your body. And, and then there's legitimate things like saunas and all these uh, professional supplement companies have their own version of a detoxification program and, and a certain diet to go right. along with it. Just because it, it, it's a catchphrase, right? Well, it is. And it's, it's hot and it's huge now. I mean, you got juice cleanses, like all this crap out there. So, so I've been around it for a long time. And what, you know this, the more you know, the more skeptical you can be of things that are being talked about. The more, you know, physiology. The more you know, the less you, the less you know. Totally, yeah, well, that's it. And so, um, you know, most people, and we'll talk about this if you want, but there's phase one and sure. phase two detoxification pathways. Pre people know those pretty well. Um, but over the past probably decade, you know, every once in a while you hear somebody talk about phase three. 
Now, my problem was, is I was hearing differing things of what right. phase three was. Some people said it was binding. Some people said it had to do with pH. And I was like, all right, I, you know, what, what, what the hell really is phase three? So I started researching it. First of all, I found out what it was and realized that a lot of these quote unquote experts were wrong in terms of what they were describing it. But in so doing, there's a phase zero. And, you know, your reaction was what I had. I mean, you, you probably read enough and there's like a lot of cool papers out there, but sometimes you read something and you're like, and you rub your eyes, right. you're like, what did I just read? It's like, holy crap, there's a phase zero. And that told me, I was like, you know what? I need to go into this because there's information that no, I've never heard anybody talk about, like phase zero. And if that's something that's published in the literature and has been so for the past, you know, it was discovered in the, in the early 2000s, why have I never, ever heard about this? And then another thing that happened was, and we'll talk about this, but in phase three, and this was just my sort of cursory, let me look into this a little bit first. Um, in phase three, what I started reading was, that there are natural compounds that people are taking that are super hot, you know, curcumin, yep. for example, um, as well as things that are often found in detoxification plans and protocols that inhibit phase uh. three. I was like, well, wait a minute. How can we include something in a detoxification program designed to detoxify somebody that inhibits phase three? And then I was like, well, A, I never heard about phase zero, so I need to learn more about this. B, what we're doing right now is totally wrong. So I really need to learn about this. And the third thing that I, and this is my whole trajectory I'm explaining to you here. The third thing was that I was reading about in, in the literature, which is where I get all my info, was that with some of these nutrients that are used for detoxification purposes, there's what's called a biphasic response. And what was very clearly outlined was that at a low dose, certain things increase specific detoxification right. enzymes but that at a high dose they inhibit those same very enzymes and the takeaway of this is low doses are found in food high doses are found right. in supplements and so then i was like oh my god we are so stupid with what we're trying we think that in functional nutritional integrative medicine we're so smart we're doing things so much better than conventional medicine but i was like we are right. moronic if A, we're giving things that are inhibiting one of the phases of detoxification, and two, in doses that according to studies have been shown to inhibit detoxification enzymes. So at that point, I was like, all right, I got to start at the beginning. Like a asking questions, are we even toxic right. in the first place? Uh, does the dose of a toxin matter? Is there a synergistic effect of these things, which we hear about, but I've never seen any published studies on. Um, what are the actual, how really do phase zero, one, two, and three work together? And then ultimately, can I construct an evidence-based detox or how to test for this too, was another question I had. Can we, are you toxic? Am I, how can right. we figure this out? There's tons of tests out there, but are they valid? So these were all the questions that I sort of laid out in front of me to say, I'm, I am going to learn everything that I can possibly know about detoxification. A, to understand it better for myself, my family, and my patients. But then B, can I construct, I don't want to say the first, but an evidence-based detox, uh, detoxification protocol? C could something like that exist based solely on the scientific literature? Not hearsay, not, oh, I felt so much better after doing the master cleanse right. or some other garbage. So that's, that's the story of these. I mean, I, don't, you have, I think you have a few things to take from yeah. there, but um, that's been my trajectory. And... I will tell you, conventional medicine has it wrong because they say that we're not toxic and it doesn't cause any problems. Functional medicine has it wrong because, quite honestly, in the literature, some of the things that we're recommending and doing Stopping. is right. antithetic in terms of some of these, some of these uh, different things and pathways. So I think you answered my first question. That was, are we toxic? And should this be something that everyone's considering? Yes. And so I can and, and understand that Everything that I say, and I'll tell you if it's my opinion, everything I say comes out of the literature in some way. So I think the, the very quick answer to that is yes, that we are all, all of us, regardless of your diet, lifestyle, where you live, we have exposure sure. to something. Now, it's going to vary based on our, the, how we live our life and what we expose ourselves to, how we work. You know, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of driving and we're sort of out in the country, so I'm not, I, don't have, I don't sit in traffic, for example, with brake dust and smog. Uh, but I'm around a bunch of farmers and they're spraying all sorts sure. of stuff on their, on their things. So I might be exposed to different things than you are. But yes, all of us, all of us have exposure. One of the, the biggest 
uh, the, the CDC essentially has this, it's like a thousand page document um, that they put out. And what they do is they, they test blood and urine primarily of, you know, at this point, probably hundreds of thousands of people over the years. And there's, there's over 200 different chemicals that they test for. And people don't test positive for all of them, but they test positive for, for right. the vast majority of them. So it is, it, we, we are exposed to it irrefutably. Um, we are at least excreting it if it's showing up in urine. Right. And when they do tests on things like, uh, and this is, a, this is a cool topic too, but fat biopsies, uh, as well as when, some, we'll talk more about this, but when someone goes hypocaloric yep. and they increase lipolysis, blood levels in every animal as well as human study ever done, they go up as well. So there's a strong, strong evidence that they are indeed stored. Um, they've been, so a, c- a couple of really cool studies these are, I know I'm just kind of front loading you with all this information, but there's a couple of cool studies that looked at blood, sweat, and urine simultaneously for certain xenobiotics, which are just call them chemicals yep. or toxins. They were negative in the blood, negative in the urine, but positive in sweat. And so that's an indication that these are in fact being stored and are maybe not being excreted via those other ways, but via, in this case, sweat. So yes, we are exposed to differing degrees they tend to be stored in fat they're mostly lipophilic and uh and yes we probably all have some degree of storage in some of our tissues so the next question then becomes great we have these things in our body do we know definitively that they're influencing our biochemistry yes so that's another fantastic question so i'll start with the easy one so what they have basically studied with a lot of these is the mechanism of action that they cause damage so some of them are endocrine disruptors, whether it's acting on a, on a hormone receptor or hormone synthesis or binding and transport or some, some element of, of hormones. Some of them are cytotoxic. Some of them damage the mitochondria. Some of them damage the DNA. Some of them uh, increase reactive oxygen species or lipid peroxidation. So it doesn't, they know that there's a mechanism. If I gave you just the smallest dose of, let's just make something up, um, DDT or mercury, it will do that to your body. Now, the dose, you may not even notice the fact. It's not going to have any impact on your hormones because it's such a low dose, which I I absolutely need to comment on also because there's some really phenomenal uh, research on that too. So they do what they do, period. Yeah. That makes sense. They like, it it doesn't matter if you have one molecule or a million of these, they're going to do what they do. That's their mechanism. Yes. So, so the, the amount it seems does matter to some degree, but, um, and I'll tangent onto this and then we can come back, but there's something in the literature and the, the most recent, stu- the, actually the first studies on this were only from 2012. So this is really, really new stuff. This one blew my mind too. It's called the non-monotonic dose response curve. And since we have a video, this is, I guess, cool. Uh, a monotonic dose curve, what they'll do is they'll say, here's a very low dose of a toxin And the higher the dose, the more damage it causes. This one's called a non-monotonic dose curve. And what they have, I'll say, irrefutably shown is that specific to endocrine disruptors only is that it's a U-shaped curve. That what they're basically saying is that a low dose, and this this just blew my mind, a low dose is as physiologically damaging as a high dose. And there's this weird sort of medium dose that appears to not be as mm. toxic. And the rat, oh, dude, I mean, I, I, these are one that I read. And right. again, I had to be like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what what did I just see? Because we often hear that the dose is the poison. And there's, there's toxicology journals that are saying, yes, that adage, we've said for a really long time, but it looks like we can't say that anymore. They're saying that mm. they can't say that anymore. And it seems, though, as if it's a really high dose, it overwhelms the system and it's going to cause damage. But at a low dose, it's almost too low for the body to even notice or, or care about it. And so the mechanism of action of those xenobiotics, whether it's mitochondrial dis- you know, or, or, or endocrine disruption, that it will do its damage. And because it's at a lower dose, the body Goes doesn't unnoticed. see it as a threat right. necessarily and does its problem. So it's, I, I haven't seen this with heavy metals or some of the volatile organic count, but the endocrine disruptors, and there's a, quite a few papers on this, and I'll tell you the, the throwback in the toxicology world is not good the- because now they're saying that the dose does matter. And the, the, a low dose, and dude, I, all I can say is it's as physiologically damaging as the high dose. 
So can you give me some examples of endocrine uh, toxins? Yeah, so to, to talk about that, I think the easiest thing to describe would be to sort of classify some chemicals. Um, so for example, there are, there's toxic elements, and these are things that are found off the periodic table, things like mercury or arsenic or cadmium or aluminum or some of those types of things. Um, there are volatile organic compounds. Those are things that are usually found in like gas. It's yep. fumes, so gas and paints and formaldehyde. Those are volatile organic compounds. Um, there are some that are considered to be natural, things like mold and some of the aflatoxins uh, that come out of those. Um, then there's um, plastics, which are things like phthalates and, and bisphenol A. Those have endocrine disrupting yep. properties. But then I think the ones of the biggest concern for a variety of reasons are considered persistent organic pollutants. And that's one of the largest categories. So things like if you've heard of PCBs yep. or DDT or a number of those things, they all fit into that category. The problem is, is that the name would suggest these are persistent organic pollutants. They're organic, they're carbon-based, they're persistent, they stay around in the environment and us. We don't excrete some of these things very easily. Um, many of those are considered to be endocrine disruptors. And I sort of alluded to this. We, we can go into great detail when it comes to hormones. But we like to say endocrine disruptor, but rarely is it discussed where. If that makes sure. sense. Well, where is this doing the endocrine disrupting? And these things impact cortisol, like uh, glyphosate and Roundup has been shown to, to decrease cortisol production and synthesis. Essentially, I, I don't believe in adrenal fatigue, but causing adrenal insufficiency, for example. Um, <laughs> every single layer of thyroid, actually not even thyroid, go up further. TRH, thyroid troponin releasing hormone, as well as thyroid stimulating hormone, as well as thyroid or T4 and conversion and binding. There is toxins that have been identified to impact every single level of that from TRH to TSH release to TSH binding to thy T4 to convert all of it. Do they tend and to be specific, the, the toxins, or is it kind of like a broad stroke? They'll, they'll influence all these things. Very specific, like BPA binds, binds on to thyroid hormone receptors itself. So now thyroid hormone can't right. bind onto it. Um, DDT and PCBs have both been uh, found to, to bind to the TSH receptors on the thyroid hormone. So now that doesn't think that there's any TSH to stimulate it, lowering T4 levels that are being released, if that makes right. sense. Yeah. Um, uh, all the polys, poly by, f I forget the name, PD, PBDEs, um, induce thyroid antibodies, phthalates block iodide, uptake into the thyroid in the first place. No iodide, you can't make thyroid hormone. Um, fungicides, metal, they've all been found to basically screw up deiodinases or thyroid binding globulin or, so they, they know. I mean, this has been studied. The, the number of toxicology. Yeah, great to know. Go ahead. Great to know, right? Because we can we can isolate like, hey, you've got this deficiency. You may have a you may completely have to this specific toxin. That's perfect. perfect. Yeah. So if someone's getting, I mean, and you could do this the same, you could do the same thing with, with testosterone. Um, uh, which we can touch upon in a second. But so, for example, if somebody has normal TSH, normal T4, but low T3, then you'd want to look at the potential xenobiotics that might impact conversion. Or if you have, uh, let's say, high TSH, low T4, low T3, that's a whole different class right. that may be doing that. Um, or low TSH, why is TSH low? Maybe something is, is affecting TRH in the first place. So you can, you can better identify what may be causing the problems based on, on someone's pattern. Wow, incredible stuff, man. So I know we're just getting warmed up too, dude. Yeah, you know, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I don't want you to stop there. I want to keep going and, and pulling into understanding. Like my my next train of thought is like getting into understanding of phase zero. Does that seem like a good jumping off point for you? Yeah. So I tell you what, if if I will, uh, if you'll let me, I'll just I'll do all three of them Great. really quickly because it's a pretty easy conversation. Yep. So first of all, the liver is not the only thing that detoxifies. It just happens to be this huge organ that, that, that does it. But um, skin has these enzymes. Um, uh, the kidneys have these enzymes. The the testes actually, which makes sense because of what goes on in the testes for sperm yep. production, reproduction. Um, so there, it's found in a variety of different things. So um, imagine a cell. So a cell, phospholipid bilayer membrane. So these toxins have to get into the cell in the first place. And very simply, that's phase zero. Phase zero is there are these protein transporters that allow a toxin to come in. They're called solute transporting proteins to allow the, the xenobiotic or toxin or whatever you want to call it into the cell in the first place. Then once in the cell, we'll just say it's a liver cell because people like talking about the liver. 
phase one is there's a there's a bunch of different enzymes. People have usually talked about cytochrome P450 enzymes. It's usually these these oxidation reduction reactions. But but phase one, the enzymes either add to or expose a hydroxyl radical or a hydroxyl group, an OH for those that, that are into chemistry. So here's this xenobiotic, whatever it was, comes into the cell via phase zero, then through a variety of different phase one enzymes, either exposes or adds, generally speaking, a hydroxyl group. Now that hydroxyl group on there, and people have some of them have talked about how after phase one, it's more toxic than the original compound. That's not entirely true when you look at the literature. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. It depends on the chemical. But it can very much act as a reactive oxygen species, as a free radical. So now it's, where is this thing? It's inside of the cell, and it's a free radical. That could damage all sorts of things inside of the cell unless it goes through phase two. Uh, and this is, by the way, this is true of the lipophilic or fat-soluble compounds. If something's water-soluble, we can, we can urinate it out. Uh, it can come out in our saliva, our tears, our urine, our stool has a little bit of water in it. So those get, we get rid of those no problem. But it's the fat-soluble ones. So fat-soluble, we need to make it water-soluble, and this is the process. Comes into the cell via phase zero, gets uh, converted in phase one. Now it's a free radical, usually. And phase two, there's a whole bunch of uh, reactions that people have probably may have heard about. Things like uh, glucuronidation or um, glutathione conjugation, amino acid conjugation, sulfation, acetylation, methylation. Those are all phase two. And these are considered conjugation reactions. All that means is it adds something to that free radical. So if it's a methylation, it just adds a methyl group. If it's solvation, it adds a sulfur group. If it's acetylation, it adds an acetyl group. So that's a con it gets something added to it. Now it's water soluble, but it's still inside the cell. Phase three is the efflux or exit out of the cell. So going back to what I said in the beginning, curcumin, I'm not going to go into, I know I'll get things thrown at me if I speak negatively about curcumin, although I could. Curcumin inhibits phase three. Uh, you know what else does, which is ridiculous? Piperine, yeah. you know, as the black pepper, yeah. that, that, that's a potent inhibitor of phase three, by the way. It, it, that's what makes things bioavailable is because uh, piperine inhibits phase three, so things get absorbed and stored better. Otherwise, it just excrete, it gets excreted out. That's how it increases the bioavailability of these things. So anyhow, um, so phase three, if you block that for some reason, now you have this conjugated thing that went through phase two, but guess what? If you can do it, you can undo it. And there's a number of enzymes that can undo the conjugation reactions that happen in phase two, and now what are you stuck with is this damaging reactive oxygen right. species inside of a cell. So once it goes out of phase three, now it's water soluble. We can urinate it out, we can poop it out, we can spit it out, we can cry it out, or we can sweat it out. And that's essentially the basics of it. Now, I've used this metaphor once before. If you imagine the room that you're in right now has two doors, yep. door number one is phase zero. Somebody comes in. What do you do? You, you put a big sticky note on their forehead. Now they're, they're pissed because they have the sticky note on their forehead. That's phase one. Then a conjugation reaction is you hand them something like 20 bucks. So now they're not mad anymore because you just gave them 20 bucks. And then the other door is phase three and they leave. Right. Now they can, they can leave and they're happy and there's no problem. But once inside the cell, if you block phase three and you take that $20 bill away, now they're pissed off again and now they can do damage to the cell. <laughs> So that's the basics of phase zero for th through phase three. And that's a that's a great visual depiction for all of our people. Um, so are those the two main? Like it, it sounds as though that your main consideration is you definitely don't want to be inhibiting phase three. It sounds like phase one and two are going inside the cell. Um, those are going to happen naturally. Obviously, we can do things to support those. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a variety of things that inhibit all of these different things. Um, uh, diesel exhaust inhibits phase zero. Now, the problem with that is if you inhibit phase zero, I mean, if you're around a lot of pollution, a lot of diesel exhaust, and that inhibits phase zero, you can't even get that thing into the cell in order to detoxify it in the first place. A hyperactive phase one and an inhibited phase two causes problems because now you have phase one doing its thing, causing all these reactive oxygen species, causing damage to cells. If you can't conjugate those with one of those phase two pathways, then that's a problem. So in general, inhibiting phase one isn't that bad because usually what will happen is, well, most people, if they have a problem, it's usually with phase two, quite honestly. Those are, those are the more nutrient-based pathways. Amino acids are used for quite a few of those mm -hmm. things. Um, somebody's deficient in methyl groups or, or sulfur groups or glutathione, either 
uh, their ability to synthesize their own glutathione, for example. Um, glucuronidation is a, is a different story. But, uh, and then phase three, yeah, if you inhibit phase three, then, then you can't even get it out of the cell, and chances are it will get unconjugated and cause damage to the cell. So coming back around, I completely um, misunderstood this ignorantly. Um, phase zero is not a, um, I, I assumed it was kind of a, an assumption, meaning like this thing went into the cell on its own accord, but this is something that we could, we could choose to either support or block. I didn't realize that when you said that. <laughs> yes, yes. It was, it's been, it was so newly discovered. I forget the actual year. I want to say, I don't know, I'm making this up, like 2006 maybe, pretty recently. Uh, and because of that, it hasn't really been adequately studied in terms of things that we can give uh, in the nutritional world to uh, stimulate its function. And we want this thing going um, into the cell, right? Because that's where it's going to yeah, get Yeah, well, listen. Yeah. So here's the deal. Um, green tea extract, the, the catechin, not green tea by itself. The catechins isolated, you know, from green tea yeah. inhibits phase three. Curcumin inhibits phase three. Uh, quercetin can inhibit phase three. Now, I'm not saying any of those things are bad. In fact, uh, the cruciferous vegetables, to some degree, can mildly inhibit phase three. Milk thistle which people take for detox all the time, is a mild inhibitor of phase three. So here's my thing. I'm not saying that those are bad. In fact, the research, curcumin is questionable, but the research behind some of those things is pretty good. They're, one, of the function, one of the benefits of curcumin, it seems, like for its anti-cancer potential, is it has to stay inside of the cell to do that. So Mother Nature, in all of her wisdom, says, all right, well, curcumin. For you to do the good stuff inside of a cell, we need to keep you inside of a cell. So we're going to have you inhibit phase three. So curcumin is great for certain things. It's all in context, but right. it's horrible for detoxification. We want to consider that room analogy. Let's say that room is filthy right now. You want to open up phase zero door and phase three door and let stuff come swooping through. If you're doing a detoxification program, you want phase zero open, you want one and two humming along, especially two, and you want phase three wide open. If you don't, if you inhibit any of those, it's not a detoxification program anymore. All right. So someone in my demographic comes back with uh, high liver enzymes, you know, maybe it's AST, ALT. Maybe they know at some level they're toxic because they're feeling sluggish, they're feeling down, their testosterone's down. What's their first line of intervention? So the first thing to do, um, and it's funny because we're so quick to jump on a detoxification program, but in terms of the order of things that I recommend, that's the very last thing to actually do. Number one is to do an assessment like we talked about. Number two, obviously, is avoidance. You have to take a hard look at your life. You know, and, and I, I can't give people suggestions because... You know, what's your house like? Is there is there mold? I mean, formaldehyde, off-gassing, uh, your work environment. I, I live around a bunch of farmers, for example, that I see them spraying things all the time. Um, in terms of uh, cleaning products, uh, personal care products, you know, all these things, all these things can add up. So try to avoid and clean up your life as much as you can. The water you drink, the food you eat, the air you breathe, it, it all contributes. Um, the next step, and this is uh, probably more difficult for, for your listeners, but this is to reduce your, uh, what I'll call exogenous load that's making you worse. So if somebody has dysbiosis or, or some kind of GI infection, uh, for example, you're probably internally, I mean, there's something called autotoxemia, that you are becoming toxic on the inside. Uh, you're familiar with lipopolysaccharides, I'm sure. Yep. Those are so inflammatory. When they want it induce inflammation in a, in a laboratory mouse, they inject them with lipopolysaccharides to induce inflammation. So if someone has dysbiosis um, or like a gut infection or they have you know, too much oxidative stress, then none of those pathways, the detox pathways, are even going to work well in the first place. So before doing a detoxification program, we have to avoid the stuff. You said reduce the stressors. We have to reduce anything that may be making ourselves worse. If you're eating uh, a bad diet, processed foods, and, and maybe you're sensitive to some of these things, you got to cut that out first because your pathways don't even have a chance of working correctly if you're, if you're eating bad foods. The next step, I think, is what I call remediation of nutritional biochemistry. So all those pathways I talked about, biochemistry, um, it's usually just called biochemistry, but it's nutritional. Every, every pathway uses micronutrients in order to run properly. And, you know, most of your listeners are probably taking multivitamin or probably not, you know, that nutrient deficient. But you have to make sure that, that you have all the stuff that you need. I mean, you know, niacin and all the different things that NAD is, is used in, uh, magnesium. 
uh, for example. And then the next one is I call intrinsic detoxification. So intrinsic detoxification, you don't want to detoxify if you're constipated. You don't want to detoxify if you're not hydrated. You can't detoxify pH. It does turn out that it, it matters when it comes to the kidneys and detox. But you got to make sure that you have the raw materials for glutathione in the first place. And then finally, and I think this is what you're asking about, but I you know, out of integrity, I wouldn't just recommend this, is doing some kind of extrinsic detoxification program. Um, I mean, I can tell you... That, that's not what I'm looking for, honestly. I'm, I'm looking for okay. all those intervention <laughs> strategies. I, I, I'm, I'm very aware of the limitations of the, extra, the extraneous um, additions to, to a diet as far as their ability to detox your body. So I really well, want to dig deep and understand it. I, th I think it's one of the stupidest things, you know, and, and I don't know if it's as Americans or just as humans, but, you know, the, the new year comes around, they're like, people are like, I, I, I need to detoxify. Mm -hmm. And they'll just jump straight into some juice cleanse fast thing and they're micronutrient deficient and they have dysbiosis and their farts, like, you'll peel the paint off walls and indicating right. that they have some kind of serious GI problem and, you know, they have a gallbladder dysfunction so they can't even excrete stuff. They're de don't do a detoxification program. Right. Like the, the best thing they can do is get healthy in the first place. Being healthy doesn't mean that you detoxify, that you're not toxic. But what it does do is it optimizes every pathway that you have in order to detoxify when you actually are trying to, if that makes sense. I really want to give um, our audience a really good understanding of what they need to know when starting to undertake a detoxification process, is it even a worthwhile consideration if fat loss and muscle building is your objective? <laughs> yeah, totally. So, I mean, we can talk about it in two ways. So I'll just, I'll talk about the fat loss really quickly. Um, two papers specifically come to mind. Both, uh, when a, a weight loss program was undertaken with the, the cohorts in these studies, um, like I said, and, and here's first and foremost, a hypocaloric diet increases levels of xenobiotics in the blood. In animal studies, in human studies, it depends on how much is stored, but it'll always go up. It's because it increases because lipolysis. Right. Yeah, lipolysis mobilization. Yep. And what they found, there's two different papers, and they looked at two different things, but one of them, um, over the period of the weight loss, the, the hypocaloric diet, uh, T3 levels went down not TSH, because I know the metabolism is slowing down and thyroid levels, but T3 went down, resting metabolic rate went down, and uh, beta oxidation of, of fats in skeletal muscle also went down. But it was correlated to the amount of toxins that went up in the blood. So this was not, I've been dieting for a while and my metabolism is slowing down and I need to have my refeeding days. This right. was positively correlated to the amount. So the, the people that had more toxins in their blood when they were doing this diet had a greater degree of low T3. Uh, it was so total T3. what the hell do we do? Well, I'll, I'll say that. The other study looked at that and was, it had to do, that, that one was organochlorines. The other one was PCBs. And it was positively correlated with free T4 levels, but not necessarily TSH. But I have thoughts on that. Um, well, I'll just, uh, my quick answer to that, I would not personally do a fat loss program without incorporating some kind of detoxification, like, like actual detoxification, which, you know, time permitting, we'll, we'll try to I'll hit upon really quickly. In terms of muscle building, now, I don't know specifically of, you know, anabolic, you know, mTOR protein synthesis, but in terms of hormones, absolutely. So I mentioned, well, there was, this was years ago, I was reading, believe it or not, a textbook on Leydig cells, you know, the testosterone producing, a whole sure. textbook just sure. on Leydig cells, if you can like geek out on that. But what I found in this thing was brilliant. And nobody reads books. I mean, our, these things just, I don't know who reads these things, but I, I thank God came across <laughs> this. There was a table in there that had every single step of, I'll call it steroid hormone synthesis, but that's testosterone. So from cholesterol transport, to entering the mitochondria with that steroidogenic acute regulatory protein, to cholesterol turning into pregnenolone, and pregnenolone to progesterone, every single step, and you know the enzymes, like uh, three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, 17 beta, and it had listed in this table, it had every step, it had different toxins listed, heavy metals and fungicides and plastics and all these different things, and it had which enzyme those things inhibit. And I was like, here you go. If you have, and but it was every level of this man, from right. luteinizing hormone on down to actual testosterone. 
Wow. And the list of things that can inhibit any one of those enzymes, like 17 beta uh, steroid, or hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, is a huge list. And so then it goes back to your question, well, who, who has exposure to these things and who is this contributing to? So when you ask if it can relate to fat building, fat building, fat loss or muscle building, <laughs> most people have no problem fat building. Um, I do, I, we all need to consider this. And if somebody in the bodybuilding world and muscle building and fat loss world, you know that we will do anything to get that edge, to give us two extra pounds of muscle just this year. So if that means like a different angle I, I do my rows on, if that's going to pack on a couple extra pounds on my lats or whatever it is, listen, this, this could be that thing that we, you know, you hear detoxification and a lot of it's crap, quite honestly, but it's all, it's legitimate according to what I've, I've looked at. And I think that everybody needs to take this into consideration and employ certain, I mean, if, if, if health is your goal, if muscle building is your goal, is athletic performance is your goal, if fat loss is your goal, I think that everybody needs to consider it. To the point that I also said, I would not do a fat loss program without incorporating some kind of detoxification, uh, I don't want to say protocol, but, but measures. Okay, so I'm going into, into a hypocaloric phase right now. Invariably, I'm going to have these uh, xenotoxins being released in my bloodstream. What do I have to do to ensure that I'm actually able to metabolize them and excrete them? Yeah, so, I mean, if you are talking about you, you're, you're lean in the first place. And, and, and what the studies have... They're a little bit conflicting, but generally speaking, the more overweight somebody is, the more they have stored. Now, that's, that isn't entirely the case. Of course, sure. And uh, interestingly, it's not just subcutaneous. There was one paper, it's horrible, but um, it's also stored in visceral adipose tissue as well. So it's, it's all over. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to really detoxify, if we're just to take a big step back, we want to A, increase mobilization, B, increase phase zero, one, two, and three, because you got to get it into the cell, metabolize it, and get it out. And then once it goes past three, phase three, we need to get this stuff out. And so yep. in terms of um, mobilization, uh, exercise, which you know most of your listeners are already doing, anything that increases lipolysis. So a hypocaloric diet is absolutely going to increase. And the degree to which it's a hypocaloric diet, if you cut back a couple hundred calories, it may have some effect. If you cut back half your calories, it'll have a greater effect. But to, so you want to increase mobilization, uh, eating it in a hypocaloric fashion, exercising, and a sauna to some degree, because the sauna is going to heat up, heat you up, and it's going to increase. The nice thing about exercise and sauna is they both increase mobilization and excretion. So if, if you're increasing sweat in any way, you're increasing excretion. Um, then in the, the interim, uh, this is, I don't know if we have enough time for this. The, the detoxification program that I created based off this is um, it's, there's some supplements, but it's very food based. And that was because in the, in the literature, first of all, I looked at human clinical studies. And if there weren't human studies, then I looked at animal trials. And there are very specific amounts of things like the cruciferous vegetables, you know, broccoli, uh, uh, cabbage, cauliflower as well as the allium family, so things like onions and garlic and chives and leeks, that they used very specific amounts in, these, in some of these papers, which was fantastic. So they had, you know, 1.3 cups of leeks, for example, and, you know, four cups of broccoli. And it showed that it upregulated certain phase two detoxification enzymes. So what, and uh, mung beans, which, you know, I don't know how many people eat mung beans. They're not terribly exciting. Um, but, but sprouted mung beans increase glucuronidation, one of the phase two pathways. So basically I've created, I don't care what diet somebody follows, but based on the, the, these papers that I read, and this is what I included in my detoxification program, is very specific amounts based on these papers. Like I said at the beginning of the call, I wanted to make an evidence-based detoxification program if I could. So I want to increase phase zero, which I don't know how to do that nutritionally very well, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And very specific amounts of cruciferous vegetables, the allium vegetables. And you know, by the way, what uh, inhibits some of these things are things like carrots and celery. And what are people juicing all day long during these detoxes? Like, we got to read the studies, man. So um, to, to eat specific foods, uh, ruibos tea and honeybush tea, 
uh, both in animal trials have been shown to increase glucuronidation. Um, there's quite a bit of, of sulfur, if you will, in some of those cruciferous vegetables and things. So that, and then St. John's wort, which everybody's heard about, in medicine yep. is probably the number one contraindicated herb because it interacts with every single other medication pretty much, like grapefruit juice. That's the other one that's known in conventional medicine. Um, grape, oh, you remember the, like the ECA stack? And, of course, and, yep. and when people, what was the other one? They use grapefruit. You know why? Yep. Because grape, grapefruit inhibits phase three. Like this, when you read this stuff, then it makes more sense. So if you inhibit phase three and you're taking ephedra or, or, or in caffeine, what do you really want them to do inside of the cell? You don't want them to leave the cell, right? Right, stay there. Yeah. So, and, and so uh, grapefruit inhibits phase three. So what do you do? It keeps it inside the cell longer. So anyways, um, hmm. pomegranate phase three inhibitor so, two. So for, you know, talking about that, people shouldn't be doing grapefruits on detox diets. So here, well, here's the thing. So it, it's all in context. If you're using that in order to help uh, increase lipolysis and beta oxidation, go for it. But not if you're trying to detox. If you're trying to detox, you got to open up both doors as wide as possible. St. John's wort does that. St. John's wort is like a detoxification herb. It's, it's usually used for depression hmm. and things. But... And it opens up phase three. CoQ10, incidentally, opens up phase three. There's not a lot of studies on it, but it was in the testes of all things. It opened up phase three. Um, so anyway, so increased mobilization, hypocaloric diet. I would not, by the way, I would not do a detox without a sauna because certain things have been shown to be secreted in sweat and no other way. And then the last thing in terms of supplements is you want to take as many binders as humanly possible. And there's some very specific ones like um, and I only did ones that are found in the research. There's a lot of things that people talk about, but if I didn't, if there wasn't papers on, I didn't include it. But charcoal, um, both types of fiber, soluble, insoluble. Cheetazan turns out I hate cheetazan, but it's it's there's papers looking at cheetazan and actually decreasing, um, decreasing or increasing the excretion of toxins. So cheetazan sucks for everything else, but it's it's actually good at doing that. A modified citrus pectin, for example. Um, I'm trying to think of if there's any other ones. But you want to bind up as much as you can in the gut and try to pull that out. You want to sweat it out as much as you can. Adequately right. hydration, urinate it out. So if all that makes sense, you want to increase mobilization. Now it's swimming yep. around in your blood. You need to get it into a cell, get it detoxified, and get it out of the cell. That's the, the second part of phase zero, phase one, two, and three. And that's the food-based plan that I put together, the sprouted mung beans and all the cruciferous vegetables and all the allium vegetables. Um, and St. John's wort and CoQ10. And then once it's out of the cell, it's water soluble. You're going to sweat it out, so you have to sauna. I would not do a detox program without if I didn't have access to a daily sauna. Um, sauna, uh, make sure the bowels are moving well, and just tons of binders, man, to, to get all of that. Um, but based on what I've seen and the evidence and the literature, this is the only program that I would follow if I wanted to actually do a detox program. Oh, yeah, it's only 10 days. And if somebody thought they were toxic, they would do this 10-day protocol, you know, every month for maybe a couple few months in, until their symptoms uh, improved or their laboratory markers improved. Are estrogens part of these compounds that you're referring to as far as... So, the, uh, <laughs> so that brings up the whole question is what the hell does detoxification actually mean? Because estrogens go through phase one and phase two. So does testosterone, so do neurotransmitters, so do cytokines, so do all these things. So what, what is a toxin? Is that estrogen toxic? If, if so, then testosterone is too, because we get rid of it the same way. So yeah, I mean, I guess the short answer is, yeah, we, we take hormones. I won't even say estrogens. We take hormones. So xenoestrogens, maybe? All better, of them. Better. And we, we push them through these pathways okay. and we get rid of them. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's how cortisol too. You know, you, you name the hormone. If it's a fat-soluble hormone, it goes through all these same pathways, zero, one, two, three, and then mm. excreted water-soluble metabolite. Amazing. So where can people find this 10-day uh, food detox? So if you go to uh, just drwalsh.com, just D-R-W-A-L-S-H.com backslash detox, there's two options. <clears throat> um, one is if someone's a fitness professional or a practitioner of any kind, I have, and I have no problem saying this, man, I'm, I'm not old now, but I'm, I'm, I'm too old to care what people think. <laughs> it's the best detoxification program I've ever seen. It is so, it is so good. I make programs that I wish I had basically. And I look at the, you know, when you create something and I know you've created a lot that, and, and especially sure. if you're kind of in the, in the woo-woo space, you sit back and you're like, you know what? I don't care who made this. This is really good. 
And you, I don't take any credit for it. No, I don't take, you know, things are channeled through us, man. And I just happen to channel all this detox. I'm like, I'm, I'm like one of these transporters. I just take all the information I and, I just, and I just put it into these videos. It's a nine hour, everything you want to know about detoxification program. It goes into, wow, it goes into great detail on this stuff, man. Like if you want to geek out on this stuff, then, then that's, that's the program to do. There's a, a I guess, a patient-based one where you basically get a couple okay. short videos and kind of walk you through step by step uh, what to buy, what supplements to get, how to do it. It's 10 days. There's two phases of it, um, hypocaloric and then even more hypocaloric. You have to have access to a sauna for those 10 days or else I don't personally think that you should even do it. Um, so anyways, uh, just backslash detox and that'll take them to where they need. You've got two other awesome programs, which I've been uh, looking at is metabolic mastery and then fat is not your fault. Yeah. Something metabolic like fitness, but, um, uh, but close fitness. <clears throat> so uh, fat is not your fault was the original one we were talking about before the call. But the feedback on fat is not your fault from fitness professionals is, is still unreal. I mean, we talked about Mark. Um, there's a couple of other guys that say yeah. that it is. It was one of the like the premier programs because basically what it does. It's called fat is not your fault. But what it is is like kind of an overall physiology course on all the major systems, how neurotransmitters relate to fat loss, how hormones do, how the gut does, how thyroid does, how liver and toxicity do, how to assess these things, uh, and then some, you know, light therapeutics of what to do if something might be out of balance. So it's kind of a, a you know, can't say physiology 101 because it, it apparently is pretty good, but that's one. <clears throat> and then metabolic fitness, that's the, the course that I wish I had when I was starting out as a fitness professional, NASM certified however many years ago. Um, it's, uh, you know, biochemistry, physiology, I'm gonna, it's not done yet, but I'm going to be doing some on blood chemistry analysis and organic acid testing and have some advanced modules on, on glucose regulation and how I don't think we know what we think we do when it comes to glucose regulation. That's where the detox program is. I'm going to be putting one together on mitochondria. And if, if I put out a program, it's because what's out there isn't good enough. Like, you think you know about glucose regulation? I completely agree with you. So did I. And then I looked into it and I thought, wow. People need to know about this. And so same with mitochondrial function. Um, if, if I think what's out there is good enough, I'll just lead it to that. But if not, then I'll, I'll put out something better. What are some of the best resources you could recommend right now, other than obviously your website and these courses? Like, what do you, where are you going to research all this stuff? And where should our... our um, Me is I'm just PubMed. straight up PubMed. In fact, I joke around. Um, so I, I, I never listen to a podcast. No offense. I never listen to podcasts. I don't read, I don't read lay people books. Um, I, 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 you know, my, uh, my, my two girls are, uh, what, five and three. And I, I lay down with them every night in bed. It takes far too long, as you, you know. read them PubMed. Um, <laughs> I'm on my phone on PubMed. Yeah. I, I, I constantly, I mean, I hate to say, in the bathroom, I'm on PubMed. I mean, I, that's <laughs> all, I, there's, there's no shortage of papers, man. And that's the only place. I will say, however, that, you know, YouTube, love it or hate it, has some pretty awesome videos on all sorts of topics that that are legit and i think that uh, that that's a good place for people to learn some things i'll tell you what that that's one of the best pieces of advice you're giving there and not giving advice is is the idea of if you want to really understand something go straight to the source and, and form your own opinion right acknowledging that any book is coming through yeah i believed in adrenal fatigue you know i believed in these detoxification programs i, I learned all that stuff man and then it's as i said when you learn more then you realize you can you can be more skeptical and so I've totally debunked adrenal fatigue. And now I think I'm totally debunking or just, I'm not debunking. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to improve the conversation that we're having about detoxification based on what's in the science that apparently not a lot of people are reading or else we'd hear more about it. So I'm just, just trying to help people quite honestly. Brilliant. Dr. Walsh, I appreciate you, man. This is absolutely fantastic. And I'm absolutely confident many people will be picking up your program very soon. Cool, man. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, Ben. And there you have Dr. Brian Walsh. If you know somebody that needs this information, if you know somebody who's a trainer, if you know somebody who's struggling to get body fat off, please go ahead and share this with them now. We appreciate your shares. We appreciate your reviews. You guys are awesome. And obviously, if you love the podcast, I'm sure Dr. Brian would love to hear about it. Send him a message on his website. And of course, I want to hear about it too. So send me a message on iTunes or on benpokolsky.com slash podcast. Have an awesome day, guys. Live your greatest life. All right, guys. Producer Trevor here to announce the ATP prize pack winner for this month. 
Thank you very much to Slagermeister for your review on iTunes. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, please contact Lewis, L-U-I-S, at benpikulski.com to claim your prize. Thank you very much, and keep listening, guys.